part of doing this is reinventing this every time you do it. So if you're reinventing it every time you do it, you can't really do exactly the same thing every time you do it. Do you see, correct me if I'm wrong in conflict. Um, in this instance, I chose to do something different. And was that, I mean, you, you've known Elsa for a very long time, so is, is that part of the process where you're just, it's a different experience with her because it's somebody that you've known for a very long time that you had a different sense of sort of intimacy with the way that you're interviewing her and, and sort of telling her story? Part of it is I had started, prior to making the B-side, a series for Netflix, which is showing here also today, Wormwood. And I started to experiment. I tried using multiple cameras um, 15 years ago at a time when the technology really wasn't there. It wasn't really possible to shoot high quality, in this case, video w with so many cameras. Now it is possible. So in Wormwood, I used 10 cameras, um, a lot. And with Elsa, I was doing it on a bare bones budget. Also, I was shooting in Elsa's garage where she stores all of her photographs and flat files. There wasn't all that much room. It's hard enough to cram as many cameras in there as I did. But I like the idea of it. It's a different way of shooting, a different idea. Um, and I've done it a whole number of times. I make a lot of commercials, how I really earn a living. And I've now shot a whole series of commercials with multiple cameras as well. And I like it. Why shoot with one camera when you can shoot with many? <laughs> I don't like it for drama. I don't like it at all for drama. I like single cameras. Because you're always lighting for a single camera. But in interviews, it produces something quite remarkable. So I'm going to continue with it. Sometimes I use the Interatron in combination with multiple cameras which also works, I've done that as well. You might say that Rumsfeld actually has an element of that. I film The Unknown Known because I was shot with the Interatron and one other camera that was right. slightly off to the side. I don't know why. <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with Elsa, is it fair to say that you are your kindred spirits of, of some sort with her in terms of the way that she's capturing people through her photography, you're capturing them through your, your filmmaking. Uh, did, was there that level of sort of um, self-reflexivity maybe to particularly with this film with her where you were thinking about this idea of capturing images, capturing time, capturing people uh, in the same way that she's doing it, uh, you're making a film better at the same time? Well, I'm sure it's not in the same way that she's doing it. But are we kindred spirits? Yes. I mean, I truly love Elsa. And we're both interested in a kind of self-presentation. People come into Elsa's studio. Uh, obviously, she is part of the whole deal. But the people being photographed are also very much part of the deal, too. They're presenting themselves to the camera. I think there is certainly an element of that in what I do as well. So um, I was on this, this Boston TV show, and the interviewer said to me, like, what do you think of Elsa's comment that I'm not interested in capturing people's souls? Do you really believe that she's not interested in capturing people's souls? And I said, well, I don't really believe people have souls. 
so maybe not. <laughs> but she is interested in capturing something, right? I had to write a, she applied over the years for various fellowships. I believe this was a Guggenheim, which she didn't get. And I kept describing her work as that perfect combination of dime store photography and Renaissance portraiture. And I'll kind of stick with that. Um, it's really hard, I think it's very, very hard to sort of define exactly what makes a person's art, what makes their art different from someone else's art, what makes it unique, what makes it special. Um, I mean, at the center of it is Elsa, uh, and how Elsa engages with people. She really does. I mean, to have your portrait taken by Elsa is to become part of Elsa's family, literally. And she's really fun to be around. I mean, I, I liked her before making this movie a lot, and now I like her even more. Great. Uh, I'd love to open up to questions from the audience. I can jump in as well, but uh, yes, please. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this movie. My family, we had our portrait taken by Elsa in 1990, and those pictures have been such an important part. Uh, my wife was just showing she has them on her smartphone right now. She had taken pictures. Aww. So thank you very much. And this movie, like, it brought me right back there to the studio, which I still remember from 1990. Um, my question for you is, I, I didn't know that these B-side pictures existed. Would, do you think there'd be any chance Elsa would be amenable to having the families acquire them? I don't know. You have to ask her. <laughs> Thank you. She might be. <laughs> she loves her B-side collection. And when I first became aware of it, I spent an afternoon, I don't know how many years ago, but it goes a ways back. We were in the garage together and she started just taking B-side photographs out of these flat files and telling me stories about them. And I thought, this is a movie. There's Elsa, there's the photographs, and the stories about the people that she photographed. And at that time, it seemed enough, and I think it still almost seems enough. Great, uh, I'd like to go to here first. Um, yeah. uh, I was wondering if you've ever sat for a photo for Elsa, and what that experience was like? You sat for a photo with Elsa, and what that experience was like? My family, my son, our dogs, my <laughs> wife, my mother and stepfather. Um, I've sat for photographs many, 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 many times. And I've been in the studio where many members of my family have been photographed by Elsa. And I remember complaining about one photograph where I thought I really looked pretty horrendous, <laughs> saying something to Elsa about it. And Elsa said, ah, wait 10 years and look at it again. <laughs> and of course she's right. The, the photographs take on an enormous resonance over the years. Uh, the photograph of my mother and stepfather, the photographs that she took of Robert S. McNamara, which mm. appeared on uh, the poster of Fog of War. Um, and Elsa has endless stories. I mean, it's not that she just takes your photograph. She wants to know you on some level. She wants to interact with you on some level. Um, I truly believe that's what makes her a great photographer is her connection with others and her interest in others. You know, more power to her. 
Do you recall when you sat like, when you sat for any of the photos in particular? Like you were talking about earlier, it's sort of when she takes a photo of somebody, it's about self presentation self presentation as well. So could you think about what you were trying to convey in those photos when you were sitting for any any particular one of them? Yeah, I wanted to look really, really smart and interesting. <laughs> um, or something like that. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to have my picture taken by Avedon years ago. And Avedon and Elsa share something in common. It's interesting. Avedon engages you in a conversation. He's actually relating to you as, you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but as another human being. <laughs> and you're having this conversation, and then all of a sudden, this flashbulb goes off. And it comes out of nowhere. It's not anticipated. It's not expected. Well, you know that something is going to happen at some point, but you don't know at what point. Elsa's very much like that. You're engaged in a relationship. You're engaged um, in a conversation often with Elsa. And then, pop, the flash goes off and the picture's taken. And how she decides where and when to do that, I guess your guess is as good as mine. That's part of her art. We, we're going to have to wrap up. I'm going to allow one last question. And I thought I saw somebody in the very back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I was wondering about Elsa's work post-Polaroid. And also, if you could tell us something about the person to whom the film is dedicated. Who is it dedicated to? Do uh, I even remember? It's a band. <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> Um, Ann Petroni was my office manager for years and years and years and years and died of cancer um, a couple of years ago and of course she knew Elsa well and Elsa knew her and it's an enormous loss to me. I knew she would have liked the film a lot and I dedicated it to her. Simple as that. And then, I, I mean I, I would often describe the Unknown Known, which was about Donald Rumsfeld, um, a, a kind of a project of hate. <laughs> um, I promised myself that I would grow to like him in the course of making the movie. How'd that go? It didn't go so well. I, um, I would say, uh, Having interviewed serial killers, mass murderers, um, all kinds of sociopaths and psychopaths and crazies, um, I've liked every single one of them, but I just couldn't bring myself to like Donald Rumsfeld. I think I needed some additional kind of therapy, or maybe a drug regimen. <laughs> but nothing really seemed to work. So it was maybe a labor of hate, <laughs> which is not such a bad thing. Hate is not so bad. It's a good <coughs> thing because many things are hateful, and what other emotion should you show to them to express how you feel? Let's celebrate hate. <laughs> but Elsa was a labor of love because I love that woman. She's a uh, He's kind of fabulous. Definitely. So thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you, Errol.